Hi, my name is Dr. Anita Barker Fox, and today I'm giving this presentation on behalf of Lexi King, a former honours student at the University of Tasmania. Now, Lexi's research was focused on evaluating the potential for reprocessing the Bobadil tailings. This is located at the Rosebury Mine in Western Tasmania. Now, Western Tasmania, we'll all know, is a fascinating place, um, both in terms of natural beauty, but also in terms of mineral wealth. So in the Mount Reed Volcanics, for example, we can see that there's a whole host of world-class deposits. Mount Lyle, Henty, Hercules, Rosebury, Q River and Helia. Now these uh, mine sites, uh, many of them were operated um, and established in the early to mid 1900s. And what this means in terms of waste is that there's potential for higher concentrations of the target phases still contained within some of that older waste, particularly if we think about tailings and at depth in those tailing storage facilities. And um, the other thing we have to think about here is these are massive sulfides and anybody who's worked in acid and metalliferous drainage space will know that any mine waste associated with uh, these types of deposits can present significant AMD risks. So what we have here is an opportunity to look at these um, potentially hazardous materials in terms of AMD and think about if there's an opportunity to reprocess them, pull out some additional commodities in those older materials and really drive um, economic rehabilitation at these various mine sites. And this is actually something that's being undertaken at the Hellier uh, gold mine uh, to the north of Rosebury. And here there's about 9.5 million tonnes of mine tailings. So during the late, 20, uh, during late 2018, NQ Minerals, uh, which is the company that's operating the site, um, they commenced production of lead, zinc and uh, gold and silver concentrates. And, and they did that by dredging the tailings and putting them back through the existing plant and pulling out those commodities by fine tuning the recipe. So basically what we're seeing is an opportunity for economic rehabilitation. And here's proof of one just to the north of Rosebury. So if we think about um, Western Tasmania, there's actually opportunity for this type of activity at lots of sites. Um, obviously I've highlighted a few here in the red boxes and there's also the opportunity to look at other new technologies to reprocess them. So Mount Morgan, for example, in Queensland, um, there's a company that's established a joint venture, so Green Gold and Heritage Minerals, and using a new mineral processing technology, Resin, they're looking at going back, reprocessing the tailings and pulling out additional gold. So, you know, maybe this has got an application at sites in Western Tasmania. And if we think about some of our polymetallic um, mine wastes um, at places like Rosebury, uh, Kew River and Hercules, maybe there's also potential to pull out other things such as Indian. So in the Iberian Pyrite Belt, for example, um, a recent study from the University of Aachen, um, they actually undertook a study where they looked at Indian deportment um, across the, uh, the IPB wastes and found that there's potential for recovery there. So maybe there's a whole host of commodities that we could additionally win, as well as those that were primarily sought. And that's essentially what Lexi was looking at in her honours project. So she went to the Bobadil tailing storage facility, she sampled material in the upper two metres, she assessed the AMD risk and she was looking at really using mineralogical and uh, mineral chemistry techniques to identify opportunities for reprocessing the tailings waste. So just another map of where the site was here in Western Tasmania. So the, uh, the Bobadil tailings, it operated since uh, 1974. Uh, I think recently um, there's been a cessation of tailings um, deposited into it with the 25 da dam now being used instead. So um, previously the materials, um, the intrinsic mineralogical characteristics of the materials is that it's potentially acid forming with a low acid neutralizing capacity, really reflecting the low abundance of carbonates in this material. But let's not forget that tailings are not just the physical materials, it's also that process water. So that's keeping the, um, the buffering, the pH um, above um, the acid range. So essentially um, it's, it's sort of um, not gone off yet as, as it were, it's, um, it's under a, a good state. But what we have is that, the, you know, intrinsically there's a lag time to AMD formation. So that, um, that's been measured by um, other groups and through other research projects. And it looks like there's a lag time for about one to three years. So the Rosebury mine, it's no secret, it's had a history of heavy metal contamination. Obviously it's a massive sulfur deposit. So if there's an opportunity to look at transforming and breaking that source pathway receptor chain by actually looking at characterizing that source and seeing if it can be re-engineered in some way to de-risk it environmentally, then that's only a good thing. And that's really what Lexi was focusing on. So in terms of our sample locations, you can see that here plotted across the TSF. So some parts of the TSF were quite inaccessible. So around that central portion, just because it was quite moist and you know, we kind of got a quicksand situation going on there. 
but she was able to sample around the periphery of the dam and get down to about depths of um, two metres in some places. So she undertook a series of cores and also a series of trenches um, with excavators. So that was um, a good opportunity to penetrate through the oxide zone, as you can see in this video that she made here of one of the trenches. So this is trench two and it went down to about 1.8 metres. You can see certainly the upper 30 centimetres or so are quite deeply and quite heavily oxidised. So we've got kind of a distinct oxide zone at the surface, but we can see that we're getting lenses of these more sulphidic materials. So through her investigation, she was able to get a snapshot of what that sulphidic material looked like and start you know, scratching the surface in terms of understanding the characteristics and the potential for reprocessing. So looking at what Lexi did, she collected about 65 samples across those different sample locations. She put them through two different programs. So she prepared polished grain mounts for mineralogical analysis, but she also crushed and milled these samples to less than 75 microns to use in acid-base accounting tests here, which and you can see paste pH testing and multi-edition NAG testing with the resulting uh, leachates being put through a solution ICPMS instrument to measure the metal leaching potential. Um, with the mineralogical investigations, what she did, as I said, there was bulk mineralogy measured um, on those pulps too, but there was also that intact material was put through um, uh, mineral liberation analysis um, uh, instruments at MLA and um, to look at the um, intrinsic mineralogy and mineral associations. She also did laser ablation ICPMS to look at the um, mineral chemistry and the deportment of those um, focus elements we were looking for, which were mainly gold, zinc and lead. And she also obviously did um, bulk geochemical analysis on these samples too. So very uh, briefly in terms of her results, um, in terms of their sulphide abundance, we can see that yes, these are quite sulphidic materials. Certainly you can see TSF or T4, this particular area here, we've got quite high in terms of pyrite content, so um, up to 41 weight percent. Uh, in terms of carbonates, as we suspect, um, it's quite low. And if we look at a balance between um, the measured bulk carbonates against sulfides, we can see these materials are classified in an absolute sense as acid forming. However, when we look at the, the leachate chemistry and the measurement of, uh, of that through the ICPMS, we can see that actually currently these mine tailings are classified as low risk. So any leachates generated from, them, from those materials right now um, are actually quite low risk. So that AMD process or that engine hasn't quite kick-started just yet. So that relates to that lag time that was pointed out a few slides back, which is good in terms of Bioma's time to do some rehab work and undertake this type of assessment. You know, looking at the intrinsic properties of the sulfides, you know, the pyrite itself, it's not clean pyrite. We've got a lot of inclusions within that and inclusions cause strain on the lattice, which means that there's going to be a fast rate of oxidation. There's also a lot of galvanic interactions going on, which again are going to drive rapid oxidation. So we can see sphalerite, uh, sorry, galena and pyrite are all in direct contact with each other and we'll get preferential oxidation going on there. And in terms of sphalerite, again, we can see that's quite inclusion rich itself. And we can see that it's, um, well, through the laser ablation study, it was higher in iron, which means that in terms of iron deficient sphalerite, this is going to oxidise and weather a bit quicker. So we have a lot of factors here that will drive rapid oxidation. So it means that, you know, on the one hand, we have to think about this in terms of AMD potential. But on the other hand, if we're thinking about reprocessing, these might be advantageous when we think about reprocessing these materials down the track. Uh, just a quick snapshot of some of the laser ablation results we can see in terms of pyrite we had two types we had clean pyrite versus uh, dirty pyrite which was inclusion bearing and in terms of the inclusions i found all sorts such as um, galena inclusions within there silver inclusions and um, arsenic too was quite notable in these materials and if we look at um, sphalerite again um, we saw that dirty sphalerite contained mineral inclusions which again related to galena um, and um, of course um, it's high in iron which is going to drive that oxidation so if we look at gold deportment within these materials, we can see that certainly it is present within pyrite. And if we focus a bit more on the um, gold story, we can see that within um, the gold lattice, uh, gold is within the pyrite lattice, I should say. Um, but we did have some examples of free gold too within the, uh, the tannins matrix. So and considering this was quite shallow, um, some of this sampling, this is encouraging thinking about going down to depth. So in the future, what we need to do is actually drill to depth. Um, we need to, you know, really get down to the, the guts of the, the dam, probably about 20 metres or so, and really characterise the full package of the material to understand if there's an opportunity for um, feasible reprocessing at the site. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to taking questions uh, later in the session. So thanks very much.